The History of the Harrietenberg and Its Environs, Part 5 The Blockade of Negroni After the Battle of Lump Farm, General Schweinefuss marched his army back to Harrietten, where he explained that his defeat was due to the reckless impetuosity of the Pink Hussars, charging everything in sight without thought of the consequences and then running away. This excuse seems to have been accepted, at least to the extent that General Schweinefuss remained in post. However, it did not lessen the distress of the populace at the death of Colonel Herker, who was given a very public funeral. His coffin, swathed in extensive black velvet drapery with tasteful pink trimmings, was carried through the streets of Harrietten by six mustachioed pink hussars in full dress uniform, past thousands of weeping people who lined every foot of the route. The coffin and its contents were buried in the middle of the city square under a huge marble monument topped with a huge statue of Colonel Herker waving a sabre while mounted upon a horse, rampant. The Countess Harriet von Harrietten summoned Grand Marshal Baron Spankwitz to her presence and asked him to explain the poor performance of the army. The Grand Marshal simply shrugged and explained that, like cards, war was a game of chance. You tried to stack the deck in your favour and play your cards well, but even so, sometimes you did not win. His strategy had been sound. General Schweinefuss had arrived at the battlefield with the larger force, but on the day, luck had favoured the Emperor Ulrich. The Countess Harriet von Harrietten suggested that this attitude was somewhat fatalistic and inquired as to whether any lessons had been learnt from the defeat. Grand Marshal Baron Spankiewicz considered that the line infantry needed more battlefield experience to make them steadier. He felt that the exuberance of the Pink Hussars was one of their main strengths, but that maybe it needed to be directed more carefully so that it was unleashed at the right moment. He thought that Captain Toltot, though still a dashing officer, was maybe a little more considered than Colonel Herker, and he suggested that Captain Toltot be promoted to Colonel of the Pink Hussars. The Countess Harriet von Harrietten agreed to promote Captain Toltot. Is there anything else? she asked. There was something else. King Leonardo XIII's artillery had proven very successful at the Battle of Tripod Farm, and so the Grand Marshal Baron Spankiewicz thought that Harrietten should have some artillery of its own. The Countess Harriet von Harrietten laughed at him. You seem to forget, she said, that cannon are a naval weapon, and Harrietten is landlocked. Where am I supposed to get cannon from? The Grand Marshal said, that he thought Harrietten could make some. And how are we supposed to do that? asked the Countess. We do not own the materials, understand the techniques, or have the experience to make cannon. You are talking nonsense. The Grand Marshal pointed out that Harrietten made plenty of muskets, and a cannon was like a musket, except bigger. So he thought that Harrietten did have the material to make cannon and did understand the basic techniques involved and as for experience he knew a man who had at one time held a senior post in a foundry making naval cannon in the lands over the sea but due to certain personal misfortunes had found it necessary to leave that post and relocate to another jurisdiction. He thought that this man would be happy to place his services at the disposal of the Countess.
for a certain consideration, I suppose, said the Countess. The Grand Marshal Baron Spankovitz admitted that the gentleman in question did have certain debts of honour that needed to be settled, and that there were certain other expenses involved, but the costs were not excessive. Very well, said the Countess. Do the necessary, and build me a battery of cannon, but keep it a secret. If my sister finds out, she will want me to use them to invade Greenmead. Meanwhile, in Greenmead, the Honourable Mary Green, Lady of Greenmead, had not been idle. As intended, she had recruited a second regiment of line infantry. Following representations from the Governor of Tollin, she had also recruited a second company of the Forest Foot Foresters. This had happened as follows. Captain Arbuthnot had not been happy in Tollin. The Governor of Tollin expected the Forest Foot Foresters to do lots of soldierly things, like patrolling the surroundings and standing guard duty. Captain Arbuthnot found managing these activities to be something of a bore. He had therefore suggested to the governor that increasing the number of men under his command would enable his force to perform its duties more effectively, and suggested that he lead a recruiting party back to Forestfoot to facilitate this. Now, the governor of Tollin was, of course, Eloise von Schniffelstadt, and she was keen to gather as many forces as she possibly could, because she fully intended to win back her empire. She had therefore put Captain Arbuthnot's proposal to the Honourable Mary Green. The Lady of Greenmead's primary concern was defensive, rather than the recovery of her aunt's previous dominions. However, additional light infantry would be useful for either purpose. She therefore promoted Captain Arbuthnot to colonel, and dispatched him on a recruiting mission to Forestfoot, as he had suggested. Colonel Arbuthnot did not need to be asked twice. He immediately promoted Lieutenant Jones to be captain of the first company of the Forestfoot Foresters, and, leaving the first company and its new captain in Tollin, took a small party of men to Forestfoot. Within two weeks, he had recruited the additional men required to form the second company of the Forestfoot Foresters. He then remained in Forestfoot to personally oversee the training of these men, in particular ensuring that they were skilled in camouflage, stalking and marksmanship, and the butchery, cooking and consumption of venison. Eloise von Schniffelstadt had also been busy. As she had hoped, various subjects of the empire that used to be hers had joined her in Tollin, so that the old boys were virtually back up to their full strength of 600. Some of the new recruits had backgrounds that were maybe a little colourful, and had proven to be excellent shots. Despite Colonel von Flussing's protests, Eloise had decided that these men could usefully be deployed as light infantry. She did not want to form a separate unit for this purpose, as her prejudices still led her to consider that light infantry were an unruly lot, and so she wanted to keep her light infantry under close supervision. Instead, she placed them all in the 6th Company of the Old Boys Regiment, where they would be under the watchful eye and iron rod of Colonel von Flussing and his officers, and could either fight as a regular line infantry or be deployed to form a skirmish line if required. While the Battle of Lump Farm had stabilised the situation in the short term, the position of Emperor Ulrich the Angry was still exposed. He knew that, until he destroyed Eloise von Schniffelstadt, she would be a permanent threat to him. The loss of Spongler meant that trade heading south from Negroni bypassed his territory, leading to a considerable reduction in customs revenue. Although he had won the Battle of Lump Farm, 
The armed forces of Harrietton still posed a threat from the southeast, and further incursions could be expected from that direction if the opportunity arose. And he faced these threats pretty much alone. Although his alliance with King Leonardo XIII of Panini still held, cemented as it was by a mutual reliance on the trade in cedar squirrel fur, that relationship had cooled somewhat since Ulrich had unexpectedly married Bettina von Schniffelstadt and declared himself Emperor of the Petty States. It did not seem likely to the Emperor Ulrich of the Petty States that Panini would provide him with military support unless Panini's own interests were directly at stake. Altogether, given these circumstances, the military forces available to him looked somewhat limited. Although Colonel Ritter and the Karasenbackers had done him good service at the Battle of Lump Farm, he did not fully trust them to fight for him in a war against Eloise von Schniffelstadt. This was in fact rather unjust to Colonel Ritter, who was a simple but deeply honest and honourable man. However, the Emperor Ulrich did not look to build the Karasenbacher regiment above its current strength of one squadron, and he sent that one squadron south to Drabble to keep watch on what Negroni was up to in Spongla. This left him with the Earl's own regiment and the two companies of the Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps. He based these in Schniffelstadt and sent Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar back to Dreck with instructions to raise a further regiment of line infantry and two squadrons of light cavalry. With him, he sent Colonel Larderstock to be held under house arrest in Drek. Having removed Colonel Larderstock from the scene, he renamed the fancy boys as the Countess Own Guards and recruited new men to bring the regiment up to strength. He also replaced all the officers of the regiment with his own appointees. Although this regiment was nominally under the command of his wife, in practice, it was firmly under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Lapskaus, who had previously been captain of the second company of the Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps. Over in Negroni, the Senate was in a self-congratulatory mood. As Colonel Accardi was still languishing in a Panini prison, the Negroni grenadiers were placed under the command of Colonel Ragioneri, who had previously been a tax collector. He was also appointed military governor of Spongler, replacing Captain Ponzi in that role. Captain Ponzi and his Purple Mountain Bersaglieri were withdrawn from Spongler to guard the port of Negroni, while the Negroni grenadiers, now back to its full complement of men, and the Negroni cannoneers were sent to Spongler in their place. Colonel Ragioneri wasted no time in revising the import and export tariffs charged at Spongler, exempting goods imported or exported by the merchants of Negroni from all tariffs, while significantly increasing tariffs for goods imported and exported by anyone else. However, the mood of the Senate changed when the two frigates of His Majesty King Leonardo XIII of Panini's navy appeared offshore. Simultaneously, a letter from King Leonardo was received by the Magister, informing him that the port of Negroni was under blockade until such time as the Senate of Negroni firstly committed to making a significant annual payment to Panini, secondly appointed Crown Prince Leonardo as Magister for life, and thirdly, dissolved itself. The Senate immediately responded to King Leonardo, indignantly rejecting these terms. The result was that any neutral ships sailing into Negroni were stopped by the blockading frigates and redirected to unload their cargo at Panini. Any neutral ships sailing out of Negroni were left unmolested. For King Leonardo, 
had no wish to irritate any of the lands over the sea. As for any ships sailing in or out of Negroni that belonged to merchants of Negroni, these were captured, recrewed and sailed to Panini. The results of the blockade were that trade into Negroni ceased and that Negroni faced an economic collapse. It also became apparent that Panini was sending ships to resupply the blockading frigates at sea, and so the merchants of Negroni, and the members of the Senate in particular, would all be bankrupt long before the blockading frigates had to return to port. The prospect of bankruptcy caused the members of the Senate considerable distress. The Senate realised that it might have been somewhat precipitate in simply rejecting King Leonardo's proposal and reconvened to reconsider its position. Its members all agreed that, while bankruptcy and falling under the sway of the antiquated popinjays of Panini were both rather unattractive, the latter was preferable to the former. In any case, it was clear that action was required, and the sooner the better. Delay would only prolong and exacerbate the current period of economic pain. The question was simply whether to fight or negotiate. Now, the members of the Senate were merchants, not military men, and their natural inclination was to bargain rather than battle. But their negotiating position was weak. Paying protection money was one thing. After all, the balance sheet did not care whether this went to the Empress Eloise or to King Leonardo. And the Senate could accept that. But installing Crown Prince Leonardo as tyrant of the city was a hideous prospect. At the end of the day, well, they might have to agree to this or be reduced to beggary. And beggars can't be choosers. But having a go at fighting first didn't seem to have much downside other than potentially costing the lives of a few hundred men, and the Senate therefore decided to give it a try. The members of the Senate did consider if they could get someone else to do their fighting for them, but the only land powers in a position to invade Panini were Drek and Schnifelstadt, and the Emperor Ulrich was unlikely to attack his only remaining ally in order to assist a state that had just snatched Spongler from under his nose. And the only naval powers in a position to help were the lands over the sea. These have the naval forces to obliterate Panini's two frigates many times over. But it was one thing to invite them in, and quite another to subsequently persuade them to leave. The idea that Negroni could attack Panini by land was also quickly ruled out. The only land route to Panini other than by marching through Schnifelstadt territory, was over the Purple Mountains. The only troops that could realistically traverse the Purple Mountains were Captain Ponzi's Purple Mountain Bersaglieri, and this alone would not be a sufficient invasion force. And, even if it were possible, sending a larger force into Panini would leave Negroni open to attack by the Emperor Ulrich. Now, Negroni did have a navy. It consisted of a single frigate, the Campari, which would therefore be outnumbered two to one in a straight-up fight. But if the Campari could somehow get past the blockade, it could sail to the Isle of Cedars and do a little blockading of its own. And disrupting the cedar squirrel fur trade would at the very least improve Negroni's bargaining position. So. It was decided that two merchant ships, the Rosa and the Flamingo, would leave harbour, and while the blockading frigates were thus distracted, the Campari would try to run the blockade. And thus, the following morning, the Rosa and the Flamingo, with the Campari following some distance behind, sailed out of Negroni, down the estuary of the River Schniffel, and out to sea. The navy of His Majesty King Leonardo XIII of Panini was commanded by Admiral Pisello. 
As I have said, this navy consisted of two frigates. The larger and more heavily armed was the Cavatappi, under the command of Captain Verdi, and Admiral Picello used this as his flagship. The smaller and slightly faster was the Carafa, under the command of Captain Barker. That morning, the wind was blowing offshore from the northeast. The Cavatappi and Carafa were both separately beating back and forth, covering the estuary mouth, first heading southeast and then tacking and heading northwest, passing each other in the middle of each beat. When the Rosa, closely followed by the Flamingo, emerged from the estuary, the Cavatappi was heading northwest, having just passed the Carafa, which was slightly further inshore and heading southeast. On the quarter deck of the Cavatappi, Admiral Picello studied the Rosa and Flamingo through his telescope. Seeing a pair of merchant ships flying the purple flag of Negroni, he ordered Captain Verdi to intercept the Rosa and had a signal raised, ordering Captain Barker to intercept the Flamingo. Captain Verdi barked orders at his crew and the Cavatappi turned to starboard into the wind tacking back toward her prey. Both the Rosa and Flamingo turned to port and headed directly south. The Rosa was riding higher in the water than the Flamingo and slowly pulled further ahead of her companion ship. This is because the Flamingo was carrying a full cargo and the Rosa was not carrying any. All the members of the Senate of Negroni considered that they had great minds. This may or may not have been the case. However, they certainly all thought alike. Every member of the Senate had thought that it was a good idea to use merchant ships to distract the blockading frigates while the Campari slipped off to the Isle of Cedars. And Every member of the Senate had thought that the ships used for this purpose, which would almost certainly be captured, should belong to someone else. As the members of the Senate between them owned the entire merchant navy of Negroni, this was problematic. Finally, they had all reluctantly agreed that the owners of the ships that were sent should be compensated. The Rosa was a very old ship, and the compensation offered was significantly more than she was worth. The Flamingo was not a particularly old ship, but the owner of the Flamingo did have a warehouse full of cheap wine from Soissage, and he had no other liquid assets. There was no market for that wine in Negroni or anywhere other than in the lands over the sea, where they would drink any old filth from Soissage in the mistaken belief that they were being sophisticated. And so he had sold the wine to a merchant in the lands over the sea and entered into a contract that required the owner to deliver that wine to that merchant. And if the owner did not do so by a certain date, which was rapidly approaching, then he would be subject under that contract to certain onerous financial penalties and the merchant could draw the amount of those penalties directly from the owner's bankers in the lands over the sea. This was all well and good, but any such payment would be made on the owner's credit and the owner was not in a position to repay the resulting debt. Defaulting would ruin both his business and his reputation. However, the amount of compensation on offer was adequate to both pay the debt and provide the owner with some much needed working capital. The Flamingo was therefore sailing out of Negroni and she had a full cargo of wine because there was nothing else to do with it. And as the owner mentioned to the captain, it was even possible that in the confusion the flamingo might slip through the blockade 
In that case, the owner could fulfil his contract and the captain could use the owner's credit to purchase a cargo in the lands over the sea to bring back to Negroni. By the time the Flamingo returned, it seemed certain that Negroni would either have surrendered or triumphed. In both cases, the port would be open and pent-up demand should mean good prices for the first cargoes coming in once the blockade was lifted, and the captain would be entitled to a small share of the profits. As the Rosa drew ahead, seeing both the Carafa and Cavatappi heading southeast, the captain of the Flamingo ordered his ship to turn to starboard, with the intention of passing behind the Rosa and heading off to the southwest. Seeing the flamingo turn away, the carafa tacked to port to head back in a northwesterly direction and so continue to close the distance between the ships. The Rosa and the Cavatappi were now on converging courses, with the Rosa on the Cavatappi's port beam. As the gap between the ships narrowed to long cannon range, Admiral Picello ordered that a broadside be fired not at, but in the general direction of, the Rosa. Having thus advertised her destructive capabilities, the Cavatappi signalled the Rosa to strike her colours and prepare to be boarded. Although the Rosa continued to defiantly fly the purple flag of Negroni, Admiral Picello was gratified to see her turn to starboard towards the Cavatappi. He ordered Captain Verdi to back sail slowing the Cavatappi so that the Rosa could come alongside. Now, the Rosa was a merchant ship, not a warship, but she had on occasion sailed in some of the more lawless regions of the ocean. In those regions, piracy was commonplace, and the Rosa therefore carried a few small six-pounder cannon on her deck. While these would not overly inconvenience a larger vessel. They did have a deterrent effect against smaller coastal pirate vessels, and having them on board made the crew feel more confident. The captain of the Rosa did not have any illusions that he could take on a frigate in a gunfight, and had no intention of doing so, but he did order these cannon to be loaded and run out. As the Rosa sailed straight toward the Cavatappi, she cut across the bow of the Carafa. To avoid a collision, Captain Barker had the helm put hard over. The Carafa heeled and turned to port, now sailing to the southwest, parallel to the Rosa. The Rosa was now directly under the broadside of both of Admiral Pacello's frigates, and this caused her captain some apprehension. However, he felt that his honour required that he make a token act of defiance. The Rosa fired a solitary cannon to port. The cannonball flew high over the Carafa and splashed into the sea beyond, and before the startled Captain Barker could order any retaliation, the Rosa had lowered the purple flag of Negroni and replaced it with a very large white flag. With no attempt at any evasive action, she then sailed straight into the side of the Cavatappi. The Carafa sailed past the entangled ships and turned to starboard to resume the pursuit of the Flamingo. However, as she did so, Captain Barker saw the Campari sailing out of the estuary of the River Schniffel and heading to the west. Now, Captain Barker had been ordered to intercept the Flamingo. Doing so would not be dangerous or difficult. The Flamingo was unarmed, and the Carafa could sail rings around her. It would also be lucrative. The Flamingo was sitting low in the water, and capturing a fully laden merchant ship would mean plenty of prize money for Captain Barker and his crew. Granted, the blockade had already brought them several prizes, but Every man on the Carafa considered that, in relation to prize money, more was better. Captain Barker thus had every incentive to obey orders, as a good naval officer should. But Captain Barker was not a good naval officer. 
he was an excellent one. He knew that the Campari could outpace the Cavatappi, and that it was touch and go as to whether she could also outpace the Carafa. And he knew that having the Campari at loose on the open seas would be very bad news for the merchant shipping of Panini. He therefore ordered full sail to be set, and the Carafa headed northwest on a course to intercept the Campari. He then signalled to Admiral Pusello to inform him of this change of plan, and to request that the Cavatappi provided the Carafa with support. The captain of the Flamingo saw the Carafa bearing down on him under full sail, and knowing that he could not outpace her, and could certainly not fight her, had the Flamingo turned toward her, preparing to strike his colours. However, to his surprise, the Carafa sailed at full speed right across his bows and headed off to the northwest. He therefore continued to head south. The appearance of the Campari had rather wrong-footed the crew of the Cavatappi, who had been occupied in boarding the Rosa, accepting the surrender of her captain and crew, and searching her in vain for anything worth looting. Eventually, they managed to disentangle the two ships, and, leaving a small prize crew on board the Rosa, the Cavatappi headed after the Carafa. Seeing a second frigate heading in his direction, the captain of the Flamingo once again prepared to be challenged and boarded. But the Cavatappi passed astern of the Flamingo without incident, and the Flamingo's bemused captain gratefully continued on his course. The Campari was under the command of Captain Martini. As the most senior officer in the navy of Negroni, Captain Martini might justly have expected the title of admiral. However, an admiral's pay exceeds that of a captain, and the Senate had not considered it necessary to award him the customary promotion. Notwithstanding this blow to his prestige and pocket book, Captain Martini did not even consider resigning his position. He had a job to do, and if he was lucky, one day that job would involve blowing some of Panini's ships out of the water. And it seemed that his day had come. The Carafa and Campari were now both sailing west, alongside each other, their courses slowly converging. The Carafa was smaller than the Campari, and outgunned, and so Captain Barker did not want to get into a one-on-one -on -one close-range gunfight, which he would lose. As the Campari came within range of the Carafa's cannon, he ordered that a broadside be fired at her sails and rigging, hoping to slow her down, so that the Cavatappi could catch up, making it a two-on-one fight. The Carafa's 18-pounders thundered fire and smoke, but without the desired effect. Captain Martini was itching for a gunfight, but he only wanted to fight one ship at a time. He needed to deal with the Carafa quickly, after which he could either fight the Cavatappi or use his superior speed to evade her, as he saw fit. As the ships continued to close, he fired his broadside, and the Campari's 24-pounder cannonballs tore into the Carafa, destroying the ship's wheel, damaging the rudder, and bringing down the fore topmast. The Carafa slewed and slowed, and the Campari started to pull ahead. Captain Martini wanted nothing more than to fire a few more broadsides at the Carafa and finish her, but he did not do so. He now had a speed advantage over both the frigates chasing him, and considered that it was time to show them a clean pair of heels. As the Campari drew away, leaving the Carafa in her wake, Captain Barker played his last card. The Carafa had two nine-pounders mounted in her foxhole, facing forward, and Captain Barker ordered that these bow chasers be fired at the receding Campari. The result? 
was that a cannonball tore away the Campari's mizzen top yard. With her sails and rigging thus disarranged, the Campari was slowed to the point that she was no longer pulling away from the Carafa. Captain Martini cursed. He had lost his speed advantage. Further, he had no stern-facing cannon, so he was unable to return the continuing fire from the pursuing Carafa. He then smiled, realising that, in this circumstance, he had no option but to turn and fight, and then grimaced, realising that he needed to take out the Carafa quickly before the Cavatappi caught up. He ordered the Campari to slow further, ordered all the cannon to be loaded and ready to fire, and, leaving only enough men at the guns to fire one broadside, ordered the rest of the crew to arm themselves with cutlasses and present themselves on deck. The Carafa was steering erratically, which was to be expected, given that she was missing her ship's wheel and half of her rudder. She veered across the Campari stern, and the ships once again drew level, with the Carafa now on the Campari's starboard side. Both ships fired their broadsides simultaneously, and, even as the echoes of the discharges rolled away, Captain Martini had the helm put hard over, with the result that the Campari turned to starboard, and the two ships came together. Captain Barker immediately realised the peril of his position. The Campari was the larger ship, and the first boarders were already jumping down from the Campari's deck onto the deck of the Carafa, screaming that all hands were required on deck to repel boarders. He drew his cutlass and charged into action. Sailors are, on the whole, somewhat unpolished, and they do not fight cleanly. We will therefore pass over the hacking and biting and gouging and stabbing that ensued. Suffice it to say that the hand-to-hand combat on the deck of the Carafa was bloody and prolonged. From the quarter-deck of the Campari, Captain Martini looked down on the melee. The crew of the Campari outnumbered that of the Carafa, and were slowly gaining the advantage of them, but too slowly. Captain Martini could also see what his men could not. The Cavatappi was drawing ever nearer. Captain Barker did not have time to stand and look at anything. He was in the thick of the action, and therefore very busy. Time and again, he and his crew were pushed back, and time and again, he rallied his crew and pushed back in turn. But each time, the boarders gained some ground, and although Captain Barker was one of nature's optimists, he was beginning to harbour pessimistic thoughts and feeling increasingly uncomfortable. His discomfort was, however, alleviated when whistles sounded from the Campari, summoning his adversaries back to their ship. On the Campari, Captain Martini was frantically giving orders to the men he had recalled, sending some below to crew the port broadside and mustering the remainder on deck to repel boarders in their turn. Silently, the Cavatappi drew along the port side of the Campari. She did not fire her guns for fear of the shot passing through the Campari and causing damage and casualties on board the Carafa. But her bulwarks were lined by men, armed with pistol and cutlass, and all looking rather menacing. The port side guns of the Campari boomed, throwing their full weight of shot at the looming Cavatappi, and boomed again, but with no apparent effect. The ships came into contact, and sailors from the Cavatappi swarmed onto the deck of the Campari. This melee was also bloody, but it was not prolonged. 
It seemed that the crew of the Campari had had enough of fighting for one day, and while Captain Martini was keen to fire cannonballs at people from a distance, he was less enthusiastic about personally fighting hand to hand with naked steel. Standing on the quarter deck of the Campari, surrounded by the belligerent crew of the Cavatappi, he surrendered his sword and his ship to Admiral Picello. Thus ended the Battle of Negroni.